one week season. Happy Friday, everyone, and welcome to this week's uh, Slate Breakdown and Edge podcast with uh, the infamous Hilo, uh, the man of many hats and many podcasts. Uh, I know he's uh, had one before. He's got another after. He's got a busy day here, and we're going to give you some high-level looks at uh, these five games he broke down, and we're going to start with uh, the awesome, awesome juggernaut (laughs) of an offense the Chicago bears. Let's go, man. Yeah. There's a nothing better than ripping four podcasts on a Friday, dude. Right. Yep. It's been, it's been awesome. Uh, oh, I can't say right. Golly. <laughs> we got <laughs> called out on that last week. We, we did. So <laughs> they, uh, uh, we'll, we'll try to watch it and make sure. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you, looking at this game, right. Everybody knows, right. Dallas pasty has just been oh, you said it. Uh, unreal this year. Uh, what's crazy to me though, is if you look at the prop lines, how many, it's not just fields, how many quarterbacks in the year 2022 have a passing prop of around 160 yards this week. That's just crazy to me. I think it's like four this week alone, which is Mm -hmm. insane. Yeah. I mean, the, the bull case for the bears here is that we finally saw glimpses of what they want their offense to be moving forward. We haven't seen that. It's been very static. They have not gotten anything going. They've been trying to mask an offensive line that has underperformed in both run blocking and pass blocking by playing heavy sets. They've, they are above average in, in 12 personnel with two tight ends on the field. They're above average in 21 personnel. So what, what we've seen so far is they're trying to mask their shortcomings as opposed to think about how we can overcome them, if that makes sense. So what we finally saw a, a, an offensive game plan um, in national television, everyone was watching. We saw an offensive game plan where the bears were actively trying to overcome their deficiencies on the offensive line, as opposed to mask them. So what that means is increased run play designed run plays for Justin Fields. That means passing on first down. I think they had 11 pass attempts on first down uh, last game, which is way, it's more than the like first downs they've scored in complete games or, or first downs that they've had in complete games. It, it was wild to watch. Yeah. So they, I think it, the ratio was like either, I think it was 11 fields pass attempts or designed rush attempts on first down versus like six carries on first down in that game. Something like along those lines. That's off the top of my head. I wrote up those numbers somewhere. Um, But like, think about like that to me signifies that they are leaning forward and trying to overcome their deficiencies as opposed to just like routinely finding themselves in long down and distance to go. And now they're just setting fields up for failure where he tries. He doesn't have the, I guess I'll put it this way. Watching fields play, he does not have the pocket presence enough to know when I can escape or I need to throw this ball away. And what that has led to is all these sacks against. It has led to routinely finding themselves in long down and distance. Now they are looking to get fields um, out of the backfield, moving it like designed runs on first down. They're looking to hit quicker strikes on first down to set up like second and three and second and four, instead of finding themselves routinely in like second and 10 plus. Um, which is like if they're if they're looking for a home run hit on first down, like to the metrics boys, it's like oh they're passing on first down. Well, it's like no, dude, they're they're basically failing at looking deep on first down, and then they're getting sacked, and now they're in second and fourteen, second and sixteen. Now, like, I'm hoping that at least that that kind of leaning forward and trying to stay ahead of the sticks mindset will carry forward because they have the talent. The talent has never been a question. It's at, at least amongst the skill positions. Like look at fields at quarterback. They have Darnell Mooney at wide receiver. They have Cole Komet at tight end. Um, and then some of their secondary pieces are, are high upside pieces. They just have not been like utilizing them right. And that makes sense because of the amount of turnover that they had in that organization this off season everything from the GM to the head coach, to the entire coaching staff, to standing up an analytics department, like everything, they cleaned house. They absolutely started from scratch. Pace is gone. Now they have all this, this 
these moving pieces. And that's going to take time. The hope is that now they're starting to figure stuff out where like from a team identity standpoint, from a moving forward, how we're going to try and win games standpoint, because they are absolutely loaded with draft picks this coming year. And if they use the rest of this season to figure out like what, first of all, what do we have? And second of all, how do we utilize those pieces when we start bringing in like the offensive linemen, the defensive linemen, when we start focusing on like rebuilding for the future, I think that we could see, and this is all just like pure conjecture based on the analytics and film. I think that we could see the bears start to score some more points going forward. It can only go up. <laughs> yeah. Um, that yeah. is a, uh, you know, one of the things, you know, I was happy to see because I, you know, I'm single entry three max guy. So I had one lineup for Thursday night and I chickened out and and did only a four, two bear stack instead of a five, one. I just couldn't, I couldn't bring myself to do the five, one. And if I would have, I had a really good night. I would have had a huge night if I wouldn't have chickened out. Uh, because yeah. it was such low ownership the other way. And my bring back was Ramondre, right? Like yeah. that was, right. That was the bring back there. One of the cool things to see as you talked about was fields rushing prop was eight and a half rushes for the game. He had eight in the first half mm -hmm. and most of them were designed runs. Yeah. So like you talked about, that was, that was really encouraging to see. But as again, we get to this slate and we look the bears 16 and a half points, not, don't imagine I'm going to really be playing any bears this week. The Ezekiel news is interesting to me uh, with the Cowboys. You know, does that open up uh, some Pollard Dak second week back? Where do you, uh, where do you see yourself going with the Cowboys this week? From, if we look at the Dallas backfield as a singular entity and we combine like Zeke plus Pollard, they are like top four, I believe top four or five in scoring of as a backfield. Now we have to think that a vast majority of the backfield is going to flow through Pollard this week. And the matchup is neutral to above average. What has killed really the bears run defense is just the sheer volume against, right? So like on a, I said, right again, on a, on a <laughs> per like touch efficiency basis, they're non terrible. Um, I know uh, right there it says 24th in DVOA and 24th in yards allowed per carry. That is simply a factor of teams just hammering them over time again and again and again. And at some point, those big bubbas up front are going to get tired. And that is what is leading to these like second half gash plays against. All that to say, like, I think that you have to view Pollard if we project him for 80% of the backfield usage this week, which is highly likely to happen based on the composition of their roster, I think we have to view him as like a bona fide top five back on the slate. The cases against him are very clearly in the potential leverage bucket because he's, he's going to garner ownership. Like it's Tony Pollard is one of the most hyped off season players in the NFL. And like now is like the only the second time in his career that he's going to have the backfield to himself. Like Zeke has missed one game um, and Pollard put up like seven catches on nine targets and scored twice, I think in that game. So that's what happened the one time Zeke has missed. And so now like it makes a ton of sense. I know Zeke is a tough dude. I know he wants to play. I know he, he views his job as being like available for his team. But from like the perspective of we just got Dak back, we still have playoff aspirations and we have our bye week next week. I think it's highly likely that we see Zeke held out. And we saw it, I think, uh, yesterday. Jerry Jones just straight up like hit the override button. He's like, you are sitting. <laughs> he said to like, yeah. he said to media, he's like, yeah, Zeke's not playing. And it's like, okay, when Jerry has his hands in, in the situation, you know that like he's kind of taking over. He's like, you're, you're going to sit. So, um, I would say that Zeke sits. Uh, I know he's doubtful now. Um, and I would think that Pollard sees the vast majority of the usage out of that backfield. So I think we have to be accounting for the fact that he is on paper, a top five back this week. I'll also be interested to see with the Cowboys defense, 
while they're expensive, how much people are really willing to spend up this week. Are they willing to spend up and, and pay for them? You know, last week, obviously, they were a huge, huge score, had that great defensive game uh, at a high price. I'll be interested to see if people are willing to go back to that well as some leverage this week. Yeah, I went there last week and it was uh, it was fruitful. Um, this week, the two highest priced defenses in the Cowboys and a team we're going to talk to shortly in the Eagles um, are the clear and away top on paper plays. And we based on the, like the the state of DFS right now, NFL DFS, people just don't like paying up for defenses. So if they are going to stay at like this modestly projected ownership um i'm gonna be all over them me too that was dallas was great for me last week uh speaking of ownership we're gonna move over to something we we expect to see much higher ownership at this week uh the cards and the vikings almost at 50 on the over under total I'm off dalvin i am not on the dalvin train i did i wasn't on the dalvin train to start the year I starting to look at him like Kittle almost though. He's going to have one big week here where he really b- breaks the slate, but I just can't pay up for him at this point. Yeah. So Dalvin is a case of his price is slow to react because of how the pricing algorithm works. So he is still garnering ownership and the DK pricing algorithm takes into account ownership as they adjust the prices. Obviously they take into account like previous performance, but they also, uh, and this is something that I don't think a lot of people know. They also include um, previous ownership into their algorithm uh, for pricing. So what that tells me is the, like his, his performance has not really been there from a box score standpoint because he has reduced now to like a one a back as opposed to borderline workhorse that he has been in the past And the passing game involvement has not been there to offset that decrease in expected carries. So it just naturally like his, his, his touches per snap rate is on par with last season, but his snap rate has come down to the point where he he's moving from like 80% to like 65% of snaps. So obviously there's going to be a decrease in his rushing load. What we thought coming into the season with like this offense is going to be this like forward leaning pass offense is we thought that his pass game usage would offset that decrease in pure rushing attempts. What has happened is that has not been the case. Um, So the Vikings are near the bottom of the league in targets to the running back position. And it's just not a big part of their offense. Looking back because I was pretty heavy on Dalvin this year in best ball. Looking back, like where did O'Connell come from? He came from the Rams and they are, have routinely over the past three years been at the bottom of the league in running back target rate. So it makes sense that now coming into the season, they are not using the running backs heavily in the past game. So I missed that uh, in best ball, but now, yeah, his price is slow to adjust because he's still garnering ownership, but the workload is so much lower that he he is like completely removed from my from the the standard like OWS kind of gag rule of always one Viking. It's like he's just not in that anymore in that discussion for me. So I think the one Viking though that is going to get owned insane amounts this week is Mr. Irv Smith. We have seen how the Cardinals run defense has been very good this year, and their defense against tight ends on that side of the ball has been very, very bad and have been just completely gashed by them. I will not be shocked to see Irv at 40%, 50% ownership. If I see those numbers, like when he finally lands, it would not surprise me in any sort of way. There's a, there's a lot going on at the tight end position. Well, I guess the the entire state of the slate, right? We have, God damn, I said right again. (laughs) <laughs> with the the state of the quarterback position and the state of the tight end position is a one and then everybody else so like at quarterback it's it's Jalen Hurts and then everybody else and then at the tight end position it's George Kittle and then everybody else and why what I mean by that is the guys that can put the slate out of reach by by putting up a 40 burger 
Like that is just Jalen Hurts and that is just George Kittle. So if that's the case, now we have to think about like how we're going to attack those positions. If you're playing one of those guys, you are saying, you are betting that they will put the slate out of reach. If you're playing anybody else, you are saying that the top player at the position does not put the game out of reach. So for tight end, that's George Kittle. And you're saying that I'm betting on touchdown variance basically working in my favor at the position. So I really, on a slate like this, theoretically, from a theoretical standpoint, you don't want to be playing players that are highly reliant on touchdown variance at high ownership. That said, I do like Irv. Where I personally will be probably utilizing him is in like Kirk Cousins, Adam Thielen, Irv Smith stacks. The reason being is you're bypassing the perceived top option at the position or at the, on the team in Justin Jefferson. We know kind of the Cardinals have largely for the entire season erased opposing wide receiver ones. And that's come through a combination of Byron Murphy has been playing this like semi shadow role and they've been rolling additional strong side safety help to opposing wide receivers once. So when your top cornerback plus safety double is like being dedicated to a singular player, like that's obviously going to limit that player's upside. The, the, the highest output we've seen from a wide receiver one against the Cardinals this year was Chris Olave last week. And it took like, it took the Saints running the most offensive plays they've run in a game at 71. It took 14 targets. And from a per target efficiency standpoint, he still had a fairly modest game. He caught like half of his targets. He did break 100 yards. That all comes together to like, I have interest in playing Irv Smith in ways different than the field. But I will not be using Irv Smith as a one off. I will not be using Irv Smith as a correlated pairing with a member of the Cardinals. Because I think that's just going to be so over-owned relative to Irv's chance of scoring multiple touchdowns, which is basically what you're saying by playing him. I can I'm on that boat. If I if I stack the Vikings, it's cousin Seelin Irv only. Like that's the only way I'll have any exposure to that side. And I don't know that I will. There's some other slates that I really like um, as far as that goes. What about on the other side of the ball? We know there's going to be a ton of ownership there. Right now, the cards aren't projecting as high on ownership. Nukes first week back. Uh, while he didn't get a touchdown, he had over 100 yards. What what do you see there from a leverage standpoint? There are a lot of moving pieces on the Cardinals' offense right now. Um, what that is going to do is create a situation where their individual performances have an extremely wide range of outcomes, because we don't know for certain, like how that offense is going to operate. Like look at last week where it was Nuke's first game back. We had the, um, we had Robbie Anderson signed midweek prior to this, to the week. So we knew he wasn't going to get much run. And we had Marquise Brown that was out and he's going to be out for another four to six weeks. What did they do? What did Cliff do instead of utilizing like a primarily perimeter wide receiver in AJ green on the perimeter and running him opposite nuke, like nuke standard X wide receiver role. That's his spot. They could have shifted AJ green who was filling in for that role over to the Z and kept Rondell Moore in the slot. And instead they played Rondell Moore on the perimeter at an 86% rate, which is absolutely absurd to me for a 5'8 wide receiver. I don't know what they were trying to do. I don't know why. The thinking is, now that Robbie Anderson, and I guess the thinking is twofold here. The thinking is probably that they were holding AJ Green out because they were trying to trade him before this coming week's Tuesday deadline. The there's other rumors going around that like the Packers might have interest. God dear me as a Packers fan, please do not trade for AJ green, (laughs) but (laughs) that notwithstanding, like that is the, I think the logical explanation for why AJ green did not play. The next logical step is now with Robbie Anderson as like a Z type wide receiver, like this, this in motion wide receiver who is a deep threat, which is what they need and what they didn't have for the entire season, because when Nuke was out, they were using 
um, Marquise Brown in this like borderline X Y type like perimeter off it was on funky. the line, perimeter on the on the line of scrimmage wide receiver, and then they would bring him into the slot at at some rate. So like that's not what he was brought in to be. So Cliff is basically trying to fit these square pegs into round holes to make these players fit his scheme. And that is not, that is very much in the realm of like the fake sharp uh, analogy that we've given, or I guess moniker that we've given him, right? Uh, Damn it. (laughs) And (laughs) so (laughs) if we think about like, what is the logical or what makes most sense from this offense? And again, this is like through the assumption of rational coaching, which for Cliff, we can't really do. But if we were in Cliff's shoes, like, I, if I were in Cliff's shoes, I would bring Robbie Anderson up to speed. He would play the Z. I would have DeAndre Hopkins obviously serving as the X wide receiver in his moderate A dot role, his possession style wide receiver role. Um, and I guess side note on that, he did bring Nuke into the slot at like a 22% rate last week, which was good to see. We want to see the best playmakers on the team like utilized in position or I guess to maximize their upside and shifting him in motion into the slot is a good way to do that. I digress. So I'd have Robbie in the Z, obviously X, obviously in the, uh, or nuke in the X position and then allowing Rondell Moore to run his more natural, like slot style wide receiver role. They can use him downfield out of that role. They can use him and crossing routes. They can do things to get him the ball in his hands with upside. He did not have that last week. He did not, he was not running the routes to get him the ball in space or to maximize his talents, which is like this yard after catch ability. So if that transpires, this offense looks a lot different than it has at any point this season because they have pieces that are natural fits to those roles. So if that happens, Nuke is a high upside volume piece. Rondell Moore is a sneaky high upside, relatively modest volume piece. And then Robbie Anderson is hopefully just running wind sprints <laughs> to, to, right. stretch, to stretch the field. Right. We just want to, we want to see him catch we a couple need, and get a TD. We need this offense to open up vertically and they haven't had that piece. And they've been trying to still run their same Cliff Kingsbury air raid, quote unquote mm-hmm. offense, which is just this horizontally spread offense that looks to get basically confusion from the defense by their routes just going like this and one, you know, Deandre Hopkins on the perimeter, just running down 12 yards and running an out or a curl or a comeback or something like that, a low upside route. But we need that offense needs. And this is why I have been so down on Kyler Murray this entire season, that offense needs some piece to keep a defense's secondary honest. What we've seen is like the safeties have been creeping up to clog the middle of the field against them. They've had uh, basically in zone coverage. It's been so easy. Like teams can just keep the play in front of them in man coverage against the Cardinals. It's like lock up the perimeter guy, follow him into the linebackers and the safeties. And then like you, you can swarm the point of reception and keep them to six yards. They need that, like that presence to push a defense and to keep them honest whether that's Hollywood Brown whether that's Robbie Anderson like they just need some piece to keep the defenses on their heels and off of like the I guess pushed back from the linebackers it will uh it'll be interesting to see if they can actually function that way or if the we want Cliff fired chance continue in the valley there Dude, it has been so painful. I mean, both of us live in Arizona. It's been yeah. so painful to watch this team try to fit a square peg in a round hole over and over and over. And like the thinking is, I guess Cliff's thinking is that if you beat something so hard, it's eventually going to give. It's not the case in the NFL, bro. It's just not going <laughs> to happen. Like teams can just sit back and prevent, just watch you run circles and get tired and tackle you. Uh, because these these routes that they're running are so low upside generating. Um, I mean, I bet so, AJ Green's prop last week because it was so low, and I'm like, <laughs> they're not going to put Rondale Moore on the outside. He yeah, was one and a half. I'm like, they're not going to put him on the outside. They're not going to put the little five foot eight guy on the outside. 
and as you noted, what did they Lo do? And behold. They put him out. To, they put him out to the whole game. I couldn't. I couldn't believe it. It was. It was genuinely yeah. unbelievable. So uh, let's so, move on to a game I'm super excited about this week, and I think the slate's going to be excited about overall. Is that's the Dolphins at the Lions. This is one of the games that has the opportunity to break the slate. That if you don't own it, just like last week, right with the with Mr. Chase, which that's such a bummer. He's out four to yeah. six. Um, I have a lot of Chase in best ball, so that's uh, that was pretty sad. But this is one of those games that if it hits right, you don't own it. We're we're not going to have anything there. Tua looked uh, back to himself, but the Lions defense has been so bad i'm gonna have a hard time just not playing the dolphins every which way from raheem to tyreek to i might even play gasecki this week like because he's because of his price point (laughs) because if right if i'm not going to play george as you talked about those options are there um what are your thoughts especially with um the injury maybe to howard uh on the dolphin side uh, you know, Armstead, they, they got, they definitely have some injuries here. Yeah. And um, it's interesting, particularly with Xavier Howard, because he popped or he reappeared on the injury report with a, an existing injury that he's fought through this season. Earlier in the season, he was listed as groins, both groins. And now he, after playing again, after coming back to the lineup, he repopped on the injury report with a groin injury. So groin hamstrings like soft tissue stuff those are the things that can obviously if you don't give it enough time to to rest up and heal can have a high degree of re-injury rate um so that's an interesting one um obviously they have uh noah igbinajin who has been like this perennial whipping boy that we've picked on for years and years (laughs) while he's been in the league um so the backside of that defense yeah it could it could be in rough shape this week with the injuries that they have. Um, When we look at the other side of the ball, the Lions continue to be the first overall in the league in man coverage rates. They now now have to chase around Jalen Waddell and Tyreek Hill. Jalen Waddell and Tyreek Hill. Tyreek Hill is PFF's top graded wide receiver against man coverage this season. He's been top five for years and years and years. Like the dude, because he is a cheetah. He runs really (laughs) freaking fast. It's hard to stay with him in man coverage. You either have to play way off where they can adjust and they can hit him on outs. They can hit him on comebacks. They can get him on a crosser with the ball in his hands. They have a lot of options of how they can utilize Tyreek Hill's speed, particularly against man coverage. You also, so think about like Jeffrey Okuda running, trying to chase around Tyreek Hill all game. That's going to be a sight to see. Um, <laughs> the pure upside from Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle is like bar none at the top of up on the top of the slate. That said, we have some pretty he- heavy ownership expected for Tyreek Hill, so there's some things to consider there. Um, and when you get a defense playing so much man coverage, that also opens up additional room for splash runs against because if a back through either being really fast, a la Raheem Moster, or via the scheme of the run game, if they can get behind the linebackers, they are now, they have like 15 yards of, of green They're area. Gone. To, they, They're absolutely they, gone. They have, they have a secondary with their backs turned to them, with yeah. only like the weak side safety with eyes on them. <laughs> so that could be a, a high per touch efficiency situation for her, Raheem Moster here who has now emerged over the last four weeks as like the unquestioned lead back in this backfield. Yeah. It's um, it'll be interesting to see. This is one I, I want to leave teased. Our DFS interpretation this week is really, really good on this. And if you're an inner circle member and part of one week season, you get to see that. So this, this has some really cool upside thoughts here. And I will be excited to listen to you and X talk about this uh, later today. Me and Mike. Mike is going to be filling in. Oh, Mike's filling in. Okay. Yeah. Mikey. All right. Well, X did have a birthday this week, so. Yeah, we both had uh, we had some conflicts. Um, X is actually he's getting his um, flooring his kitchen, done. In yeah, his he's house. getting his kitchen done. Yeah. So he's staying at an Airbnb, and um, 
my kiddos are going to a like water park birthday tomorrow, like all day it's at great wolf lodge. And we had some help so that I could be here to, to do the, the pod, but um, that fell through. So I didn't want to send my like pregnant wife running after four kids at a water park alone. So we had to move stuff around a bit. That, that was probably good for your marriage. Yeah, I think so. Speaking of break the slate, we talked about him earlier, right? We have uh, Mr. Hertz, 26 points on their side versus the lowly Steelers who – at some point, I feel like we're going to break the slate. I feel one of these weeks, right, the Steelers stack when they get it together and they hit are going to do it. I don't think it's going to be this week versus the Eagles defense. But I do have some interest in maybe a bring back on, with the Eagles. What are, your, what are your thoughts approaching this game? You have to, I think you have to look at the macro state of this game and go from a top-down approach to, to fully like grasp how this game is likely is to play out. And the Eagles are number one in the league in first half scoring. They average three touchdowns a game in first halves of games, which is like 21 points a game in first halves through six games played is, is fairly significant. That said, look at their second half scoring. They're down there with the Titans in second half scoring this year. They average 5.8 points scored in second half. So we have a very clear... Instance. And also like their pace of play, their pace of play is up in the top five um, in the league in the first half. And it falls all the way down to like 30 or something like that in the second half. So they have a very clear MO to score some points and take their foot off the gas if they're not being pushed. So now like you look at like the theoretical optimal way to play this game is very likely to either stay away to play their defense because now with them taking their foot off the gas, that gives the Steelers additional possessions to uh, with the ball in their rookie quarterback mistake prone quarterbacks hands. Um, even though the Steelers are, are above average in pass blocking metrics, even though they've only given up 15 sacks this season, just if, if Pickett is being asked to undergo 50 dropbacks, like there's going to be some chances for, for sacks and turnovers there. Like look at in Pickett's two full games this season, he has 44 dropbacks and 52 dropbacks. So they're asking, they're basically falling behind and they're asking him to like, let's see what we got. Let's go. Um, and he's a, he's a gunslinger. So if he is slinging the ball around, that's when you see these mistakes piling up. Um, so Back to like the optimal way of approaching this. It's either to stay away because the Eagles are going to score their points. And if those points are not concentrated in the first half, now they're taking their foot off in the second half to play their defense because now you, you generate some leverage. They are a pay up defense and people don't like to do that. And you're direct leveraging off of the highly owned quarterback off of some, some pass catchers off of their running back um, who probably isn't going to garner a lot of ownership, but um, that's a different story. And and three, like you're, yeah. you're altering the, the, the way that you're allocating salary on your roster. And then the third way to play this game, which I think nobody is going to be doing, is to gain access to the Philadelphia um, offense through the Steelers. Because the way that the Eagles put up like slate-breaking scores is if they're being pushed. How are they going to be pushed? The Steelers have to score some points. So... An interesting thing to think about is like Kenny Pickett plus a pass catcher or two and bring it back with a member of the Eagles and gain access to the Eagles that way. I'll be interested to see uh, on that. It's it's I've definitely had some thought as I've looked at the slate for this week to approach it that way because they are going to be so low owned. Mm -hmm. um, it's the Eagles D. No one's going to want to play them against the Eagles D and that what if, right? Um, we talk about you know last week i think was a great example he almost had me talked into it but pappy was you know, in his write-up talked about carolina's defense could take the narrative like hey we're not giving up hey we're not coming down hey we're going to come out and shut down tommy and what they do they came out and they shut down tommy at no ownership uh so there's uh, it's always good to critically think your way through the entire slate. Uh, and I definitely think that's a, going to be an interesting way to look at this one. And we're going to finish up here with another 50 burger, the Raiders and the saints. 
um, Josh Jacobs, the bell cow, the running back everybody drafted and wanted as their number one RB, uh, said no one preseason. <laughs> this and is a this is a super crazy. interesting game. Yeah. Um, I really like this game, and the reason is we have a high game total. We have concentration on both offenses, and it's kind of playing third fiddle to the other high game totals um, in the Cardinals and the Vikings and um, the game we just talked about uh, with, the, with the Eagles. So look at like the state. Let's, let's take a step back and look at some, some biases associated with this game. Number one is probably the Saints are an elite run defense. Look at their metrics. The Saints are no longer an elite run defense. They are not. Um, Look at the biases with the Raiders. Josh Jacobs, nobody wanted him offseason in best ball. Um, and I think the field has been extremely slow to adjust to the fact that he is seeing a top three workload at the position. It's like they started the season. They wanted Brandon Bolden in passing downs. They wanted to lighten the load on Josh Jacobs on early downs. What are they doing now? It's like Brandon Bolden was active but did not play a single snap last week. And they're using um, – I forgot his name. They're using the the other pass catcher dude <laughs> as the as the pass catching, but it's more like a pure change of pace uh, backup pass catching role, which is kind of weird to think about. Um, Josh Jacobs is like top three in overall workload. He is in a route at an increased rate. He has seen targets, and he's not coming off the field on um, third downs like he had been in the past. So, like he is a workhorse. In this league, Josh Jacobs, in the year of our Lord 2022, he's a workhorse. Um, so if the field is slow to react to that, his price is probably still too low for that role. And he's priced at like 7.5 this week. It's probably still too low for that role. That is like that, that's like CMC on the Panthers, and that is Saquon Barkley. Like that's where he should be priced based on that workload. So that's another bias, a bias um, with this game. What else do we have going? We have the Saints, who Michael Thomas has not practiced yet. He's still likely to be out. We have Jarvis Landry, who has not practiced yet. He's likely to be out. We have Marcus Lattimore, who has not practiced yet. He's likely to be out. Now let's look at like what Marcus Lattimore has meant to the Saints' defense. Everything. We talked about this. We talked about this a couple weeks ago yeah. when it was the leading up to the first game with Lattimore expected to be out. I guessed that they would run a heavier rate of zone coverage because they are right above league average at 33% man coverage this season. So league average is about 28%. Um, I guess that they would run a higher rate of zone coverage to account for the fact that their top corner was not in the lineup. They have not done that. Over the last three games that Lattimore has missed, they are exactly at 33% man coverage. So they are not changing anything with their defense. If I'm the Raiders game planning for a known commodity. We know what the, the Saints are going to do defensively because they haven't changed anything with the absence of Marcus Lattimore. But they have their like non-starting A game defense secondary. Like There's a lot that can happen from an upside perspective there. Shifting back to the Raiders, like what have we seen from them? They started the season with two weeks above league average in pass rate over expectation. Since then, since week three, they have had every single game below league average in pass rate over expectation. We saw it last week, like um, Devontae Adams came out and had like six catches on the first drive and a half. And then he had like two, one the rest of the game. I think it was one the rest of the game. Yeah, I think, yeah. It was, yeah so he started with, he, had, he ended with like seven catches for 96 yards, something like that. Um, so yeah, like this is a team that they have changed their identity almost 180. And now like pair that with the fact that the Saints are no longer like an elite run defense, there is upside there. Josh Jacobs, his what what the field I think is going to see is like, oh, Josh Jacobs is priced like right below Derrick Henry. Derrick Henry is a smash. Um, like what they're going to see is his price increased $1,000 from last week they're not going to realize that he's still priced too low based on his workload. So I have a ton of interest in Josh Jacobs as a, um, a pure pivot kind of off of Derrick Henry. Um, on the other side of that game, what do the Saints have offensively? It's like they have Alvin Kamara, they have 
uh, Chris Olave, and they have Taysom Hill. <laughs> like that's yeah. what their offense has been without uh, without Thomas and without Landry. So a we've also seen from the Saints that they're scoring points with Andy Dalton at quarterback, and they're limiting turnovers. And I think obviously Dalton had three picks last week. Two of them were tip balls, mm-hmm. um, but that is very clearly why they are sticking with Dalton because Jameis is healthy. He could come back and start, but they're sticking with Dalton because he limits the turnovers. He's scoring points. He's leading this offense. Um, They're averaging like 31 points scored per game over the last four Andy Dalton starts. So that's big. Also what's big is Andy Dalton is leagues better for Kamara than Jameis Winston. Yes, he is. Andy Dalton is like Kamara has seen target counts over his last four games, nine, seven, seven, and six. So that's, this is like the, the, the previous couple years, or I guess three or four years, Alvin Kamara that we've grown used to with Drew Brees at quarterback. Like he is seeing the pass game volume. All of that gives him an extremely high floor. He hasn't scored a touchdown this season. Once that happens, those nine targets are going to mix with that touchdown and provide this like, oh, Kamara is back to being able to put up a 40 burger. Like he, he is in that realm again. I've been completely off Kamara all year because he hasn't had that role. Until like Dalton's third start when I realized, oh shit, like Kamara's role has changed because of the quarterback change. And so now like who's going to play, first of all, who's going to play Josh Jacobs? Second of all, who's going to pair and play Alvin Kamara in the same game? It's like, we have two like workhorse running backs again that are now playing each other. Um, And there's only four of them in the league. (laughs) So um, that's an interesting leverage spot to think through. Also Chris Olave, like, he is the guy on this offense with Thomas and Landry out. So, um, and, and, oh, Trotman hasn't even been practicing either. So uh, Jawan Johnson is going to be a, right. an option at only 3.2. Um, so there's a lot to like about this game um, that I think is largely going to go overlooked. I think the field is highly likely if they're going to this game is going to be one-offs, onesie, twosies. When there is some legitimate, like this game has legitimate paths to being the top overall game environment on the slate. Yeah, I'm really excited. I, I think I'm going to have a decent amount of exposure here, especially looking at ownership rates coming in. Uh, and this had a really, this has a really cool DFS interpretation that uh, I'm going to save for our subscribers that if you're on one week, you can come check out. We also do weekly passes. And I would be in miss if, I didn't uh, – if I didn't talk about our NBA props and how well it's going, um, I, I would say it's uh, as hot as hot as we could be. Uh, yesterday we went four and three, so that gets to, to 67 and 34. This is from the day before. On the big slate we went 14 and eight. Um, our ROI has just been incredible. We are not going to have that kind of ROI at the end of the season. It's just not attainable. Uh, and if we do, we're all going to have beach houses. So Dude, through like nine days of the NBA season, we're up like like thirty two units, which is yeah. insane. Yeah, it's. Uh, insane. We, I think we have a great group. Um, I highly suggest come checking it out. Uh, and the cool thing with NBA that I love so much is it's daily turnover. Your money isn't held up for a week. It's in, it's out. You know, to, you know, yesterday was a smaller slate. You know, we only had seven, you know, seven bets in versus, you know, the 22 the day before. <laughs> yeah. So it, 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 it's turning over every day. So we've enjoyed that part of it. And uh, we have same, we have uh, weekly passes. You can come check us out. And one of the things we do that's different is, after you do the week of pass, you're like, well, I was dumb for not just buying the whole season. We'll credit you towards it. So uh, there, there's some cool things we're doing there. And some really sharp uh, ways to gain an edge. Single game parlays is one of them that we've yeah. been attacking. Uh, so, yeah, definitely go check that out. It's been great. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us, guys. And we will uh, talk to you guys next week. Yeah.